Hello and uh, good evening. I'm Adrian James. I'm president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and I really want to welcome you to this uh, members webinar on severe mental illness and the European COVID-19 vaccination strategy. And we've got three really excellent uh, speakers uh, at top of their field in, uh, in every way. Uh, we've got, say, the three presentations and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. You can type your question in the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, if you're into tweeting, please do tweet using the at rcpsych hashtag uh, rcpsychlive um, uh, um, uh, hashtag there and certificates will be emailed after the uh, webinar. So uh, I'll introduce uh, the, the speakers uh, when in turn. I just wanted to say something very briefly about the college role in relation to uh, the vaccination strategy in the UK. Something I learned very early on is that you have to be very clear about the system architecture. So that's really uh, who is responsible and accountable for, for which decisions and who has influence, even if they aren't actually accountable. So I was able to identify very early on uh, who are the people that you had to get information to and data rather than just arguing your case for your particular uh, interest group, that you had to get data to the right person. And very early on, back in November, we made recommendations to the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. So that's the group that looks at the prioritisation in relation to the vaccination. And we got information to them about the particular risks of those with SMI, with intellectual disability and Downs. And we were successful there that they were actually included in the, the list on cohort six around people who were, were particularly high risk because of a, a physical health uh, problem, but also we managed to get mental illness into that. We also argued in relation to uh, care homes, that care homes were prioritised in cohort one, but there were lots of people with mental illness living in the community who were in facilities that were effectively care homes but weren't designated as such. We didn't manage to get them actually changed in relation to the prioritisation, but in terms of the people actually managing the rollout of the vaccine, we did manage to get some changes there. And then later on, there was a, a really an anomaly, anomaly with the, um, the, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, uh, the real issues in relation to moving the vaccine, you could only move it twice. And so it, it, at the beginning, you could only really give the, the vaccine in a hospital hub. And we had many units, for example, with uh, older adults who were on the, uh, the um, cohort uh, number one, the absolute priorities, that they were in an inpatient facility on the same side as a general hospital, but they weren't having access to the vaccine. So we, we made a real plea and there were some changes there to make sure that older adults in those wards uh, gained access to the vaccine. And then more recently, what we've been arguing for is uh, in relation to the particular issues to do with um, inpatients, that many of them are there for a, a, a longer time than in a physical health setting. There's a human rights issue in relation to people who are there actually against their will. So they couldn't leave the hospital if they, they wanted to and were in a high risk environment. And the particular problems with infection prevention and control within mental health set settings, not only the, the, the types of buildings that we work in, but actually the, the behavior of some patients often uh, frightened, uh, upset, uh, acutely psychotic and finding it really very challenging to stick to the, the rules that would actually be safe for them and safe for others. So we did in relation to how the vaccine was rolled out through NHS England managed to get some changes and some prioritisation but perhaps less uh, successful there than we would have wanted to be. I mean finally the issue now is those who are in the priority groups making sure they actually get the vaccine and the latest figures I have is that in, in relation to cohorts one to six, the general rollout, you've got about 73.6% of people have had the vaccine. And for people with SMI, it's about 64%. So it is lower, but it, it could have been worse. And I've been speaking to NHS England just today about whether we should have another push, actually set a target 
perhaps in relation to SMI and really try to galvanise the system to make sure people do actually get to the vaccine. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, um, Dr. Marissa uh, Diaz. Um, Marissa is a clinical academic at Cardiff studying for her PhD, uh, but she's also an honorary consultant. Uh, she's a member of the International Advisory Committee of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, but also she's the UK delegate to the European Union of Medical Specialists. So Marissa is going to talk about the, the pan-European paper that looks at the vaccine strategy across the whole of Europe. So Marissa, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me now and uh, see my screen. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation and um, uh, to be part of uh, this webinar. And for those of you who are not so familiar with UEMS, that's the European Union of Medical Specialists, an umbrella organization that represents uh, over 40 countries in Europe and over 50 medical specialties. And I was invited uh, to here to present our international work, which was published just over a month ago in the Lancet Psychiatry, Severe Mental Illness and European COVID-19 Vaccination Strategies, which was led by our colleague who's here today as well, Dr. Olivia Zepiker from Belgium. And this work received uh, extensive media attention, even from outlets that we weren't expecting. For instance, uh, it was picked as an editor's pick uh, in Forbes. And actually, this is important because it shows that the general population is interested in mental illness and in topics related to that. So as I said, it received extensive media attention all over Europe, in the world, really, from newspapers, radio and TV. And actually, uh, the Lancet, the, the Mother Journal, commissioned a world report on this very topic. So I'll start by explaining why priority vaccination of people with severe mental illness is important. And by severe mental illness here, we mean people with schizophrenia, people with bipolar disorder and with major depression. Uh, I'll then explain our study, what we did, what we found, uh, how are the various uh, European countries prioritizing people with severe mental illness. And finally, why together we are stronger. So a message about what we can do. Starting with the why. Why is it important that uh, we prioritize people with severe mental illness? Well, because they're at higher risk of infection, you know, they're 65% more likely to catch COVID. And once they do catch COVID, uh, they're more likely to have severe outcomes such as hospital admission and death two or three times more likely to die. And literature from different countries, you know, high quality studies have consistently shown that people with severe mental illness, schizophrenia in particular, have higher risks. I'm just going to highlight a couple. So one you see on your left-hand side, uh, that was a paper published at the end of January in Gemma Psychiatry. And it showed that in comparison with other risk factors, a diagnosis of schizophrenia ranked behind only age in the strength of association with mortality. Uh, the other study on the right hand side was a different study uh, in, uh, published in Denmark that covered the whole population. And again, it showed that people with severe mental illness were amongst those with highest risk of severe COVID outcomes. A recent meta-analysis has shown the same thing. And whilst this meta-analysis uh, has um, looked uh, at uh, any mental illness, so it showed an increased risk for any mental illness, there's ongoing work, work that we're doing at the moment, that will look at different risks of specific groups. And preliminary findings will be shared for the first time here today in this webinar by Dr. Livia de Picker, so I shall say no more. 
but why? Why does this happen? I mean, it's really complex. We know that this group of people have a reduced life expectancy already, you know, between 10 and 20 years. We know there's high comorbidity with diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we know there are difficulties accessing care. We know there's stigma, there are environmental factors, socioeconomic factors, and there are immunological factors as well. And again, I shall say no more because we have Professor Pariente talking in a few minutes, explaining the scientific rationale for this. So when uh, we looked at uh, the vaccination strategies and we looked at the groups that were already being prioritized, uh, which uh, groups with cardiovascular, uh, lung, uh, renal disease, uh, actually, people with severe mental illness had very similar risks or even higher, but they were actually not being included in priority groups. So in summary, people with severe mental illness have high risk of infection, they have high risk of adverse outcomes which are in line or even higher than other comorbidities that are already being prioritized. So it only makes sense that they too are prioritized. So First and foremost, this is a matter of equity and parity between physical and mental health. I'm going to tell you about our study, what we did, how we did it, and what we found. We systematically reviewed uh, the national vaccination strategies uh, of 20 countries. Uh, we looked at the publicly available information, but we also recruited a network of local informants to help us give us insights into those strategies. And what we found was that only four out of those 20 countries surveyed gave priority in vaccination for people with severe mental illnesses. The ones that you see on this map in green, so that's the UK, Denmark, Netherlands, and Germany. You can also see with the black and white stripes, those countries that gave priority to people who were institutionalized. I mean, naturally, some of them will have severe mental illness. But the reality is that nowadays, the majority of people live in the community. They're not institutionalized, and therefore they were not being covered in these vaccination strategies. So really, this is how we felt. We felt like this little digger over here uh, trying to raise awareness of this disconnect between the evidence and the policies that were being applied across Europe. Uh, and, and just to, to show you just how striking this is, if you look at the right hand column here, that's about mentioning uh, psychiatric illness, mental illness in the strategies. So we're not talking just about not giving priority, but in fact, only eight countries mentioned mental illness at all in their strategies. So it's almost as if it was being forgotten. And this really is uh, what we found when we we're doing our study and we we're reflecting on this, that there may be several sources of biases that caused these risks to be overlooked. So first, initially mental illness was not included in the original studies looking at COVID outcomes. And because it wasn't included in those studies, when it comes to reviews, it wasn't covered because it wasn't there. And when it comes to policy, then it wasn't taken into account. You know, we, we don't know what we don't measure. And uh, this is what we noticed. So we, we heard from Dr. Adrian James that the UK quite early on uh, has in, looked at mental illness as a predictor, so the evidence uh, was there. Um, and countries that did this have included, and later on we have Denmark, remember I showed you the, the study from Denmark, so when that information, when people looked at that information, in the case of uh, Denmark and the Netherlands, then they changed the vaccination plans. The same with Germany. They're, they've done an umbrella review of all the existing studies, which initially did not include studies where mental illness uh, was included as a predictor. And once they looked at studies with mental illness, then they changed their uh, policies. Even uh, they even prioritize people's severe mental illness at a higher level than the UK did. 
so where are we at at the moment? Well, uh, there has been some movement. I'm pleased to say there has been some movement. And instead of the original four countries, I'm pleased to say that since we've published this study, Finland, Ireland, France and Latvia have also changed their vaccination strategies to include people with severe mental illness. And this is uh, a combination of using evidence and using advocacy and lobbying from uh, psychiatric organizations. Uh, so finally, uh, it's important to work together. And uh, this is what we did in this study. We worked in collaboration with major European psychiatric organizations. And in fact, this survey was initiated by the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology uh, and collaboration with European Psychiatric Association, with UEMS section of psychiatry, and these other two organizations here, which I shall say are probably the most important important, uh, especially when it comes to making recommendations. So that's Ilfami, which represents uh, family members of people affected with mental illness, and Gainian, which represents uh, people affected by mental illness. And uh, so our joint recommendations, which represent professionals, patients and families um, of this tree that uh, we put here. So the first one is to include both inpatients, but also out of patients in the priority groups. Uh, meaningful patient and family organization participation in developing vaccination plans. And this is important. And again, picking up what Adrian has mentioned, it's not just important about priority and giving priority, but the uptake is really important. And we know other experience, for instance, with uh, the flu vaccination, that people severe with mental illness are less likely to take up uh, a vaccination. We also know from the earlier stages of the vaccination here in the UK, that even when offered people with severe mental illness, were less likely to take that opportunity. We're not quite sure why that is. And I'm pleased to, to hear that um, you mentioned 64% uh, have taken, which uh, probably is better than we thought it would be. But it shows why this uh, second and third recommendations are important. So the third one being engagement of peer workers in providing vaccination education to patients. So to help us make sure that once offered, uh, vaccines are actually taken. So this is where uh, we want to be, this is what we're aiming for, uh, which is a complete resolution of the situation, which can only be done together, because together we're stronger and people with mental illness deserve our best efforts. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank in particular all my co-authors and uh, these European organizations uh, that have worked collaboratively with us, endorsed these recommendations and with whom we continue to work. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marissa, for that very clear presentation, but also all the work that you've done in bringing the data together and advocating for those who uh, have the most severe forms of mental illness. So thank you so much. So that nicely brings us on to the scientific rationale for why uh, these people should be at higher risk. And there's no one better than Professor Carmine Perianti, uh, who's Professor of Biological Psychiatry at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience. Uh, he's got a huge uh, um, uh, research portfolio, particularly centered around stress and inflammation in the pathogenesis of mental disorders, but also depression and fatigue. Um, and uh, a, a former uh, academic of the year from the Royal College of Psychiatry. So um, thank you so much, uh, Carmine, and over to you. Thank you so much, Adrian, for introducing me. And, um, and it's amazing to be today together with uh, Marisa and Livia sharing the stage uh, for, for this incredible initiative that they have really led over the last few months in, in support of uh, kind of, as, as Marisa said, really kind of opening the channel uh, that allows for all patients with, uh, with uh, mental disorders to receive the vaccination that they need. So the, my talk today has the aim of uh, 
um, talk of kind of convincing you that immune activation in the context of mental disorders is not just a random epiphenomena or a rare phenomena, but in fact is part of the neurobiology or, or, or the broader biology of mental disorders. And even beyond a side effect of medication and consequences of lifestyle. So um, I will touch on the literature, on the broader literature, what we call immunopsychiatry, so the interaction between the brain and the immune system in the context of psychiatric disorders. Um, Adrian has mentioned Twitter, so this is a, you can see here the kind of social media coordinates uh, for me and my laboratory, in case you want to tag me in any of, uh, of the Twitter that you may be um, thinking about writing uh, during this, uh, this uh, afternoon. And I want to start by kind of sharing with you a couple of resources that um, I'm involved with. The first is Brain Behavior and Immunity. It's a paper that published uh, both uh, kind of basic science and clinical sciences in the context of uh, the relationship between the brain and, of course, the immune system. Uh, it's progressively publishing more and more paper with a focus on psychiatry. It was one of the first papers that really took on the fight uh, for patients with mental disorders in the context of vaccine. Uh, this is an editorial that, as you can see, Lydia, who of course will be talking in a few minutes after me, uh, wrote with other members of the European community of people interested in immunopsychiatry, uh, talking exactly about uh, how we should integrate uh, basically the, the, the strategy for people with mental disorders within the, the, uh, the exit strategy from COVID. We also published one of the first studies. This is a study produced in Italy, in Milan, for one of the first studies to find that patients who were hospitalized for COVID-19 had long-term consequences in terms of mental health, something which has been done further replicated. And some of you might have seen the, the really one great paper from Oxford that was published yesterday in Lancet Psychiatry. And here you can see how um, the, in fact, what these authors found is that three months after admission, not only there was a higher uh, risk of patients developing depression or anxiety, but pointing to immune mechanisms, the higher the immune response during the hospitalization, so the severity of the immune reaction during the hospitalization, the higher the risk of this patient developing depression and anxiety three months later. And before I start kind of showing some data, I also want to point you to another resource that I'm involved with, which is a pl blog platform called Inspire the Mind, or www.inspiredthemind.org, where we present a both scientific and more uh, social or cultural based blog on mental health, including lots of lived experience described by young writers and other writers with uh, mental health um, problems or difficulties. And uh, we also had the pleasure to host uh, our president, Adrian, and, um, and in fact, a, a group of uh, the, the, the winner of the um, uh, medical, of the competition for medical students interested in psychiatry last year, who wrote, who, all of them uh, wrote a wonderful piece on different aspects of the psychiatry of the future. So please, um, and we also have many, many blogs on COVID. So please go on to these resources as well, so, uh, in case you're interested in any of these aspects. So what is immunopsychiatry? Well, it's a term that is perhaps has been as born more recently compared to other aspects of science that indicates, but actually points to the fact that something we already known for 30 years. So the brain and the immune system communicate. This is relevant for both um, emotions and behavior. And now we know that it is relevant for psychiatric disorders, both for the pathogenesis of psychiatric disorders and potentially for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. And it's based on the assumption that the immune system is not just simply a kind of, you know, a, a series of organs and cells that are in the periphery to protect us from virus and bacteria, or that get involved with the fight of virus and bacteria, as we all know now with COVID, but it actually has a profound uh, communication, bidirectional communication with the brain. And in the context of my talk, I mean, we only got a few minutes, but I want both of, uh, kind of I want all of you to focus on both these two arrows of communication from the immune system to the brain and from the brain to the immune system. Because from the immune system to the brain is in reality is almost what we, we're, we're seeing at the moment with uh, long-term consequences, both acute and long-term consequences of COVID-19. 
infection in terms of um, mental and neurological disorders, uh, both acutely and long term, with of course the development of long COVID. And the idea is that, of course, the immune system. Uh, we know that regulates mood and behavior. We know it even in the simple experience that all of us may have had with the flu or fever or infection. And those of us who have had COVID, um, I've been lucky not to have it, but I know many friends who have, and many colleagues. But we all recognize that you know the disorders, the, the acute infection felt both uh, physical, very physical, but also very mental in, in terms of uh, the change in, in, in our in our emotional and mood state. At the same time, I also want to point to the second arc of the communication, the fact that the brain can influence the immune system. In fact, as part of the, of the general stress reaction and our uh, increased state of, of distress and arousal, which often characterize biologically um, mental disorders in, in a non-diagnostic specific way, as I will show you in a second. As part of this gen generical neurobiological activation of the stress response, we also have a direct activation of the immune system, um, which is somehow part of the, our conserved stress response. The fact that in every situation of stress, our body prepares for a fight or a flight, and so it has an activation of the immune system that will assist with that. However, at the same time, this is a mechanism that, of course, then could feed back onto the brain. And you can see how you have a, you know, perhaps a situation where, a, where a, a, the arousal and the stress driven by the mental disorders creates this state of activation of the immune system, which I will describe in a second. And then this state of activation of the immune systems makes, this, makes the individual more vulnerable to the, the subsequent insult, another insult, including, of course, COVID-19. Now, we don't have a lot of time to talk about the possible beneficial effect of this area of science, but I want to emphasize that this is not all about increased morbidity and mortality. It is also about potentially new understanding of mental disorders, new tools for treating patients, especially patients who are not responding to currently available medication. I'm just pointing to this article written in Nature a few years ago by a journalist asking, you know, is, is it possible that in the next wave of antidepressants we target the immune system? So the immunopsychiatry has a lot of potential positive uh, aspect of it uh, for, for us as a community and for our patient, but also, of course, brings risks. Um, so what is the evidence that the immune system is activated in, uh, in depression and in other mental disorders? I'm go just going to show you a few key papers, some of the work that we've been conducting over the last few years. Uh, and this is one of the largest studies published in the British Journal of Psychiatry a couple of years ago now, looking at different uh, group of depressed patients, measuring us very simple biomarkers of inflammation called C-reactive protein. That's a biomarker which um, basically uh, it is captured easily by all laboratories, clinically significant, it correlates with increased risk in terms of um, diabetes and cardiovascular disorders. And, and uh, it can be, and in fact, it has been measured in many studies with COVID where the represent level of inflammation in the hundreds. Um, however, within the context of depression, so in situation where the only immune abnormality, if you like, is driven by the disorder itself, you can see that across across a group of depressed patients, treatment responsive, treatment resistant, and untreated depressed patient, the patient with more severe treatment resistant depression have this higher level of CRP, or CD active protein, which is in this particular analysis is corrected for BMI. So it's not only driven by, as I mentioned, lifestyle or um, changes in, in physical activity or even side effect of medication is actually even adjusting for all these factors remain a crucial, crucial uh, biological abnormality. And in fact, I'm also showing today uh, for the first time some data which have just been accepted in the American Journal of Psychiatry from the UK Biobank, where we, we basically describe exactly the same idea that depressed patients have elevated CD active protein, basically independently of anything else, independently of genetic, of physical health and the psychosocial factors. It's really a neurobiological abnormality or, or a broader abnormality that characterizes these disorders. Here you can see, and the, the table is a little bit uh, complicated, but uh, I'll, I'll walk you for the key findings, which is really basically is this p-value over here, which is still significant. So what this table show that if you 
in the UK Biobank, if you look at the association between higher C-reactive proteins, so marker of inflammation and depression, you can adjust for everything you want to adjust. So you can adjust for age, sex, smoking, BMI. You can adjust for trauma, so exposure to childhood trauma. You can adjust for social economic status. You can even adjust for physical health. Even adjusting for all of these factors, depression remains significantly associated associated with an increase in inflammation, so key neurobiological abnormality. Now, I've mentioned this for depression, this is possible where most of the evidence is. Where is it coming from? Um, well, certainly is coming from risk factor for mental disorders. This may be one of the reasons why patients with mental disorders have abnormal level of um, inflammation in the first place. We have data showing the childhood trauma or childhood maltreatment or exposure to early life stressors, which as we know is a risk factor for many mental disorders and non-diagnostically specific uh, risk factor for many mental disorders is, um, is an important uh, it's importantly associated with an increase of inflammation in itself, even without mental disorders. And this is uh, something that we put together in our meta-analysis published a few years ago, but they've been updated meta-analysis which showing the exact today. So just by being exposed to childhood trauma uh, is enough to create a trajectory of adult inflammation. So if you can imagine how many of the people that we see as uh, in, in our kind of patient community with truly regarded, so their diagnosis, they had had a difficult childhood, had been exposed to childhood uh, stressors in their life. This could be a one of the factors explaining why inflammation is present, increased inflammation is present in these populations. And I'm just going to show you one picture from the meta-analysis, and again, to give you a visual correlates, I want you to see this kind of really significant diamond indicating higher level of inflammation in adult individuals with a history of childhood trauma, even if they're not, even if they don't have a diagnosis of mental disorders at the moment. What about other conditions? Well, we, the research in psychosis and schizophrenia is perhaps a few years beh behind that in depression. It started more recently, but the evidence points exactly in the same direction. And this is consistent with the notion actually that Marisa has demonstrated that patients with schizophrenia have a higher morbidity and mortality from COVID because they have equally higher level of inflammation compared to with depression. And in fact, if they are treatment resistant, in this case, resistant to antipsychotics, they have an even higher level of inflammation. Here I'm using another biomarker of inflammation, it's called interleukin-6, um, is a cytokine it's measured in the blood. It actually correlates really nicely with C-reactive protein. They're probably tapping in the same mechanisms. And as you can see, compared to group a healthy control, patient with the first episode of psychosis, this is within three months of the onset of psychotic disorders, um, have higher level of inflammation. And then the subgroup of patients that don't respond within the first three months, uh, so they are particularly you know, severe and treatment resistant early on, they have even higher level of inflammation. We've actually recently published a follow-up study on the same sample, looking at clinical outcome at one year, and we found exactly the same evidence. So that these patients have, as you can see here, they have disrupted bio inflammation and metabolic status, they have higher CRP, they have higher HbA1c, so marker of uh, glucose, impaired glucose metabolism, they have the higher triglycerides, they have, of course, higher BMI. And all of these factors together also is associated with, is called here, T2 PAN. So this is the PAN score, the severity of symptoms at 12 months. So this inflammation and metabolic abnormality at, that is at the core of the disorders early on has a long-term effect, even in terms of the clinical outcome and, and, and even more so possibly for the physical outcome. But it's definitely part, again, the concept I want to put across one more time, is part of the pathogenesis of the disorders, is part of the broader abnormality, neurobiological and body abnormalities associated with mental disorders, in this case, psychosis. Um, and in, we, you know, any mental disorders actually could be characterized by this. This is a paper we just published in ADHD. So we're talking about children aged nine and 10. Um, and again, there is a higher level of CRP, higher level of interleukin-6 in this, in this children with ADHD. So all patient population in a non-diagnostic specific way are associated with increased activation. 
And so I really want to kind of uh, finish my, uh, I'll just skip this for sake of the time, but I want to finish with just again to reiterate, we're talking about abnormalities that are part of the pathophysiology of these disorders that we hope will give us actually tools to predict um, course and outcome come to personalized treatment, but unfortunately in this moment for this particular situation will also contribute to um, a more difficult outcome for patients with mental disorders in the context of COVID. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks so much, uh, Carmine, for that uh, fascinating presentation and a fascinating uh, part of psychiatry now and growing all the uh, the time. So we've now got, um, I think, 236 people who have joined the webinar. So thanks for joining us. I know many uh, watch these later on. We've got one question in the Q&A. So don't forget to post your questions for any of our uh, speakers or for me uh, as we go along and we'll come to them after the next presentation. So it gives me really great pleasure to pass on to our final speaker, Dr. Livia de Picker, uh, who is a psychiatrist at the University Psychiatric Hospital in Dufel in Belgium. She's a leading academic and she is the president elect of the Belgian College of Neuropsychopharmacology and Biological Psychiatry. And she's also the lead author of the European paper. And uh, uh, you're going to speak to us uh, about the um, sharing data from hospitalization and COVID related deaths in people with severe mental illness. So Olivia, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, re real honor to have you with us. Thank you very much. Let me just start my presentation. Let's see. Okay. So good evening, all of you. Let me start by saying I'm very happy to be with you this evening uh, to talk in this webinar about a very important subject of to which extent patients with mental illness are indeed at increased risk of COVID mortality or severe forms of COVID and thus should be prioritized for vaccination. And I've heard Adrian say at the beginning of this talk that he realized very early in the pandemic how important it was to have good data on the risks in order to be able to convince policymakers. And I have to uh, applaud him for his insight because we have observed that this is indeed true. And I'm quite sad to say that this probably was the main reason why we were unsuccessful in our advocacy efforts in Belgium, in my own country. Um, lobbying for priority vaccination for patients with mental illness. There are no Belgian data, and this is why we weren't successful in pushing for that. So I am all about hard evidence, and that is exactly what I'm going to show you tonight in this presentation, is the real data on the increased risks. So um, just like uh, Professor Parianti, I've been working on immune psychiatry hypothesis for about 10 years. So I have to admit, however horrible the pandemic has been for all of us, already very early in all of this, I realized that this was also going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity to test some of our immunopsychiatric hypothesis. Because if we believe our ideas about the role of immunological disturbances in creating the onset of mental health problems, if we believe that to be true, then it should follow that we would also observe that following COVID-19. And so the three main questions that have been burning in my mind since the beginning of this pandemic have been, are we going to see indeed a wave of new onset psychiatric illness in COVID survivors? And then if psychiatric patients with pre-existence mental illness are going to be exposed to COVID, will this cause relapses of the psychiatric disorder? And are these patients also at increased risk of uh, severe COVID outcomes? So for the first question, um, are the patients who have suffered COVID-19 indeed at increased risk of uh, a later onset psychiatric illness? I think this question has been 
answered quite convincingly by colleagues at the University of Oxford. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this study, which was published in Lancet Psychiatry in September 2020, I think, which showed very convincingly for the first time, actually, at such a large scale, they used electronic health records of about 70 million US um, residents, that there is indeed an increased risk and about one in five COVID survivors will develop a, a psychiatric problem within 90 days following the infection. And what was very clever about this study is that they didn't just look at COVID, but they also compared that with other types of uh, somatic problems, because obviously we've known for a very long time that um, when people suffer some kind of acute somatic problem, that they will then be at increased risk for um, developing a new psychiatric problem uh, very soon after that. So they, they made a comparison against the flu, against other types of medical problems during the same time window, demonstrating that indeed all of these problems are associated with um, with an increased risk of um, a new diagnosis of mental health problem, but more so in COVID than in other types of uh, somatic problems. So there is something specific about COVID-19 that increases the risk of developing a mental health problem. And then when they looked at the types of problems that people developed, well, this was very much in line with what we had expected. So it's mostly mood and anxiety problems. Uh, and this is similar to influenza or other kinds of infection. So it's not so much the type of response that seems to be different, but the magnitude. Well, and just this week, actually, the same group of researchers published a follow-up to that original study, um, showing basically the same thing. So they uh, replicated their own findings, but this time they looked at an even wider uh, sample uh, within six months after the infection, uh, including also neurological besides psychiatric problems. And their findings were that uh, about one in three COVID survivors will go on to develop either a neurological or a mental health problem within six months after the infection. And this risk seems to be more severe in, um, in relation to the COVID uh, severity. So when you look at people who have been admitted to hospital or in the critical care unit, uh, the risk becomes even more elevated with the highest risks found in those patients who had experienced some kind of delirious state or encephalopathy during their COVID infections. The types of illness, it's, it's the same thing as they had previously demonstrated. However, this time, they did also show an increased risk for psychotic episodes, which was not so visible in the first study. Um, and it seems to be that in patients who are not hospitalized with COVID, the risk for psychotic episodes is, is really not so high, but it becomes a lot higher if you look at those who had more severe cases of COVID. So overall, I think one of the most important conclusions was that the risk of either a neurological or a mental health diagnosis following COVID-19 is 44% greater than after influenza. So I guess all of these people who keep repeating that COVID is just another kind of flu, I guess this proves them wrong. For the second question, well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to withhold the answer to this for a later uh, presentation. We have just finished data collection on our study looking at this question, and we hope to get some results in the next months. So that means that the remainder of this talk is going to be focused on the final question, and in my opinion, the most important one, at least from the perspective of policy, and uh, in particular, the vaccination strategies, which we have heard about earlier, are patients with mental illness also at increased risk of severe cases of COVID. And I'm sure, or some of you at least, may have seen this come by in January, at the end of January, in the media. So indeed, a number of studies have already looked into the question, um, either looking at mental illness on the whole or at specific diagnosis. 
And this was a, an important study um, using data from the New York area in the first wave of the pandemic, where the researchers demonstrated that the diagnostic category of schizophrenia was the second highest overall risk factor for COVID mortality, second only to age. So before all the typical risk factors that you've heard about, male gender, obesity, hypertension, whatever, they're all lower than the risk that is conveyed by the schizophrenia diagnosis. But they were not the first to demonstrate that actually already in October 2020, so well before the vaccination strategies uh, took off, there were the first uh, papers published showing this kind of increased risk. This one, um, again, using US electronic health record data, showing primarily an increased infection risk in people with a recent psychiatric diagnosis, but they also showed as a secondary outcome an increased death rate among people with a pre-existing psychiatric disorder. And that was replicated in another study published also uh, in the autumn, uh, this time not based on electronic health records, but uh, a cohort study of hospitalized patients also demonstrating that the survival rates are lower if people had recently been diagnosed with a mental health problem. So at this point, we have sufficient evidence to actually look at these findings comprehensively. And the first meta-analysis has come out a few weeks ago where they studied um, 16 original studies comprising around 600,000 patients looking at severe or fatal COVID-19. So this is a, a combination of both mortality, hospital admission, ICU admission um, for the exposure of any pre-existent mental disorder. And what, research, what the researchers found was that indeed, both in the unadjusted and adjusted measures, there is a significantly increased risk. And what we are doing now, so we are uh, currently finishing our own meta-analysis, which is slightly larger than the previous one. It has 23 studies. And what we are doing is trying to differentiate the risk, both differentiating between the outcomes, so looking separately at mortality, hospital admission, ICU admission. We basically hypothesize that these rates may be different um, but also differentiating between different exposure variables. Because in our opinion, it may very well be the case that not all psychiatric disorders are uh, at the same risk and there could be differences between different diagnostic classes, but also depending on the types of uh, medication that people have been exposed to prior to their infection. So what this has allowed us to do, this, this methodology, is actually answer a very important policy question. As you've heard uh, in the first talk by Marisa, when countries give some kind of priority to patients with mental illness in their vaccination uh, plans, they usually uh, apply the SMI, severe mental illness category, as um, to determine the el eligibility of patients for priority vaccination. So that would be both psychotic disorders and mood disorders are usually grouped uh, under severe mental illness and those would be given priority, whereas other types of mental illness uh, are not included. So we try to answer the question, is this indeed um, backed by evidence looking at the contrast between severe mental illness, psychotic and mood disorders against all the types of mental illness, both in the unadjusted and adjusted models. And I think, um, especially here in the adjusted models, we, we do see an interesting contrast where in the mortality outcome, uh, it's a significant difference between these two groups with the SMI category having the higher risk, which is what we expected and also why these patients are included in the vaccination plans. But strikingly, when you look at the hospitalization outcomes and even more importantly, the ISCU admission outcomes, there is either no difference or the difference is reversed. So we see a higher uh, admission to ICU rates in the other types of mental illness and an unchanged or even decreased risk in patients with severe mental illness. So of overall, I think one of our main 
conclusions and uh, I should have added a disclaimer that these are all preliminary findings which have yet to be submitted for peer review and publication. But overall, I think um, one of the findings that I'm really comfortable in presenting for you right now is that a large proportion of the heterogeneity that we see between the individual studies is in fact caused by differences between the different disorders. And when we group disorders by category, uh, as we have done here, we can actually see that risks vary significantly with the highest risks to be found in psychotic illness, followed by mood disorders, substance use. And finally, there is actually no increased risk in patients with anxiety disorders. These are the unadjusted measures when we adjust these findings for age, sex, uh, other medical problems, socioeconomic status. It's basically the same pattern, just with slightly attenuated effect sizes, but the overall message remains. Now, clearly, these findings generate also a lot of questions, which the data will not always allow us to answer. Um, what we know for sure is that our findings cannot be explained fully by an increased infection rate in patients because we included only studies in, in which both cases and controls had positive um, PCR for COVID. We also know that when we compared uh, the models in which uh, there was an adjustment for comorbid conditions against those that didn't, there was um, a slight proportion of the risk was explained by that factor, but still a significant risk remained even after adjustments for other somatic uh, conditions that may have been present. Unfortunately, I think we do have some evidence pointing towards a contribution of a reduced access to care. Specifically in patients with psychotic disorders, we saw a striking difference between these patients having the highest mortality, but the lowest risk for hospitalization and ICU admission of all uh, mental illness. So I think besides all of that, probably, uh, and this is obviously what I would want to believe as an immunopsychiatrist as well, there is still some factors relating to the immunological and biological uh, changes of the illness itself as explained uh, just before by Professor Pariante, uh, and or the effects of the drugs, because this remains a controversial point and our data unfortunately did not allow us to, differenti to differentiate between the effects of the disorder and the, the effects of the medication. Um, but other colleagues have looked into this question and there has been a series of papers published by colleagues in Paris, looking into data from France, uh, in relation to different kinds of uh, compounds where they found no increased risk with antipsychotics and even a reduced risk uh, in patients using antidepressants before they were infected with COVID. On the other hand, there are these uh, Scottish findings or findings with data from Scotland um, looking at a whole range of uh, drugs, I think 17 different drug classes of which the one with the strongest predictive effect for severe COVID outcomes were antipsychotics. Unfortunately, the researchers did not include any kind of mental illness in their list of uh, comorbidities that they used to correct the findings for the, the underlying illnesses. So again, we are not able to, to differentiate between the disease and the drug. And we, there is really no way to determine if this risk that they have observed with antipsychotics is actually just a risk of the underlying mental illness for which people are using the compound. And that brings us back to something that Marisa has mentioned in the beginning and that I indeed have also observed uh, quite frequently that besides or outside of the studies that are explicitly investigating a research question about risk factors of mental illness, most other general studies looking at prediction, predictive factors of severe COVID outcomes have failed to include 
predictors relating to mental illness. And so we just don't know. So that would also be, I think, one of my main take home messages then. So we know that psychiatric patients are at increased risk, both increased risk of hospitalization and mortality. We don't really know what is the effect of the medication. It seems that antidepressants may be protective and other kinds of compounds may have adverse effects, but we are not sure about that. Either way, these patients need to be prioritized for vaccination. There is just no question about it. And predictors related to mental illness absolutely need to be included in every study looking at the prediction of COVID outcomes from now on. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I would very much like to thank all of uh, the people who have contributed to the meta-analysis and um, have done a tremendous amount of work uh, looking at all the data. I'm sure we have lots of questions to discuss, so I'll give the floor back to uh, the chair. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, uh, Livia, for that very clear and informative presentation. And again, all the work that you're doing. Uh, we've got uh, just about four minutes for questions. That might mean that it's just one question for each presenter. And uh, Livia, I want to come straight uh, to you for the first question. Uh, is there any specific age group where the risk is highest? So I don't think there is any studies looking at specific age groups. What we do see is that it seems to follow the same kind of trend as in the general population. So the risk would increase with age and it would also increase with age in people with mental illness. But even after correction for the effect of age, we still see an increased effect of the illness itself. Okay, thanks um, for that. And uh, a question for Carmine um, from Sangeeta. It is chronic inflammation the reason why COVID affects people with SMI more severely? Carmine. But that's certainly one of the one of the hypotheses or, or uh, one of the contributing factors because we know that if people um, are exposed to a new inflama inflammatory challenge like having a COVID infection while already having an underlying activation of the immune system, the response is much higher and higher level of inflammation um, correlate with more severe depression, more severe anxiety, more severe fatigue. So yes, I think that's definitely one of the mechanisms, if not the most important mechanism. Okay, uh, thanks um, for that. And um, a question from Charles Tannock now. Now this is a, a, a European uh, presentation and Charles, I know, was a member of the European Parliament and a psychiatrist. So thanks for joining us, Charles. And Charles's question is, do people with SMI have low vitamin D levels? Marissa, do you want to have a, a go at this? And I think the theory uh, behind that, Charles was suggesting, was that if people are asked, perhaps if they're on antipsychotics to stay out of the sun, whether they, uh, they don't build up the vitamin D that you would otherwise do. So Marissa, any evidence around that? And then I'll come to the other panelists if they have a view. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I'm afraid I, I don't have uh, an answer for that. I don't know. I'm just looking at uh, the other panellists if, if they may have uh, an answer. I think there is some, there has been some research, kind of historical research showing lower level of vitamin D, especially in patients with schizophrenia. And, and in fact, there has been a theory that you know, uh, appropriate level of vitamin D, especially early on in the development, could be protective against the causes. But, it, you know, it's one of these fields that is very complicated because, you know, the biomarker in itself is difficult to measure and it's variable, you know, there's so much variability. And there was a lot of promise that early on with the idea that having healthy level of, of vitamin D would be protective against COVID infection or for, for symptoms. But again, even that was kind of did not hold through with larger exactly. studies. Okay, well, thanks uh, for that. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, for those of you who've asked questions and haven't received answers, there's only a few of them. We'll try to get back to you with some of those answers, but this is an evolving field. As, as Livia has said, there's more studies that we've got to watch out for. We've got to really 
argue the case for people with uh, SMI. Uh, I think stigma has a lot to do with this. People, there's still a tendency in society uh, to, um, to, to ignore the, the plight of people with SMI. And it's up to all of us uh, to argue that case, to find that data, do that research. So thank you to our three presenters. Thank you to the team at the college for organizing the webinar. Thank you to all of you who have joined us and particularly those who have asked questions. So thank you so much uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening.